I just left the site on uh, East Warren and uh, the ribbon is coming along really good. Everything's looking good. It looks like we're on schedule, which, um, you know, always is good to, to be able to uh, say in, in today's climate with regard to redevelopment. But uh, I'm caught in traffic. I'm caught on 94 West and the news basically said that um, there are protesters on the freeway, which uh, which is pretty brave to do. Uh, I can't lie about that, but uh, I'm headed to the gym to, to relieve a little bit of stress and, you know, to be caught up on, on a freeway, um, you know, it's a little frustrating, but people do have the right to protest. And so I just find it uh, pretty interesting that the protesting is, is happening on East, uh, or I'm sorry, West 94 uh, on a freeway. So I'm interested to see what's happening um, ahead of me, but caught in traffic. So since I'm caught in traffic, uh, you guys are too, um, you know, but while I'm here, you know, I do want to talk about just how hard it is to um, find the right team, right? Uh, as a developer, who was up and coming, emerging at the time of uh, trying to get the project that I'm working on now on East Warren, um, get get getting that project where it's at now, or even in the idea phase, like reaching out to GCs, reaching out to architects with a developer that didn't have any real experience um, tackling these larger projects, being able to partner with the GC and architect that I have was 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 something to be said. You know, I was able to convince them to show up for me uh, when nobody else would. Right? I would reach out to a number of GCs. Um, I would reach out to a number of architects and say, "Hey, look, uh, you know, I got this idea that uh, I want to redevelop this site in East English Village." And you know, once again, with me not having um, any experience and a, a, a known brand in the city of Detroit. Uh, surprisingly, a lot of GCs and architects um, wouldn't return my call or uh, would state that they won't want to be a part of the submission for one reason or another. And so, you know, the team that I have in place now, I'm really thankful for, you know, because, you know, they've actually worked together in the past on past projects uh, they sync pretty well uh, they answer the call anytime I need them to answer uh, and they basically worked especially my GC my GC worked roughly three years for free before we uh, had an opportunity to close on the construction loan it took us three years and so for that whole three-year time frame the GC that uh, I have artisan and, and Shane uh, ben, Ian, um, you know, their team, uh, but specifically Shane, you know, he'd answer the call anytime I needed him to. He'd be on any type of funding partner meeting. Uh, he'd provide any type of updated numbers. He'd go out and, and do bids for the different various, um, you know, systems and, and um, uh, trade work that we need to have done uh, on the site in order to uh, update my pro forma and you know for three years uh, countless numbers of hours you know he, he basically uh, he did that for me for free until it actually became a real project when we closed on the construction loan um, back in March of this year so um, you know but I'm just pointing out to you that you know the people that show up for you um, that is your tribe right? That is your squad that you need to roll with, right? Even if you're trying your best at putting together a team based off of certain, um, certain rules that you, you know, kind of have preloaded, uh, you know, in the docket where you're like, Hey, look, my, my construction team has to be this. My architect has to be that so on and so forth. Well, you may start off with kind of those assumptions, but if at the end of the day, these types of um, you know, partners that you've identified aren't showing up, 
and you know you need to readjust your strategy otherwise you won't have a project right and so uh, I just want to point that out right teamwork makes the dream work at the end of the day so um, that's my that's my ramble for today uh, making sure that you uh, don't limit yourself with regard to you know who's going to be um, you know the go-to person for a particular um, um, responsibility for the project you need to more or less you know for one focus on who shows up and two uh, who has the capability of executing your vision the way you need it to, to, to be executed um, so hopefully I can show you this protest up, up front uh, or, in head, or ahead of me so we'll see Shout out to Comcast for making me a 2023 recipient for their Comcast Rise cohort. And uh, this is basically where they provide um, a bit of a stipend uh, as well as support through media coverage, uh, mentorship, uh, technology upgrades, um, such a such a beneficial opportunity for me to be a part of and for Flux City to be a part of. Um, they even sent us this swag bag or swag box with uh, a number of goodies to represent this, this, this accomplishment. So really, really appreciative of Comcast recognizing Flux City um, and, and all that we're, we're doing and all that we uh, hope to become <clears throat> and with this support, this gives us an opportunity to be seen even even more so than than where we're at now. Uh, so you know, big shout out to Comcast. Really appreciate it. So today on the ribbon job, we are pouring a little bit of concrete, nothing too crazy. So here is our transformer pad where our main tower will run underground from the uh, from the our transformer, which is basically takes the, the main power coming in from the city and transforms it uh, into our, and it steps it down in voltage and amperage, and allows us to power our building. So there'll be a large piece of uh, equipment called a transformer that'll sit on this concrete transformer pad. Um, these are all of our power caps that kind of come up out of the underground area. Uh, something on the concrete they poured is kind of in all these, all the uh, man door openings. They've got a couple doors here, uh, a couple doors around the inside. They're working right now at the front end. Um, we can take a quick walk around if we want to. But basically, the reason we're pouring these sills at the op door openings is so that we can measure accurately for all of our doors and then uh, get them all installed before it you know, gets too cold. But the idea is that before it gets really, really cold out, we want to have this building completely closed in um, so that we can at least temporarily heat it without spending too much you know, on it. Um, so that's the idea of kind of pouring these right now. Again, this is, uh, this is an opening. There'll be a, a man door here, but then this larger opening is actually for uh, larger glass panels for kind of uh, the commercial space, whatever ends up going in here, which right now the restaurant's planned. Um, it'll basically give a glass opening, you know, for for vendors kind of just to display, you know, for people walking by to kind of see what's going on inside. There will be a door uh, there. Um, this door here is going to be specifically for uh, tenant use. So the two floors above our residential units. This will be a door specifically for them uh, to access the staircase to go up and you know get to their get to their respective units. So, so Ian, what's what's going to happen to this beautiful sidewalk here? So this sidewalk here is actually going to come off because, as you can see, the height of this concrete is you know a good two, three, four inches up. Uh, as opposed to this sidewalk existing right now. So what's going to happen is we're, this sidewalk's actually probably going to get torn up. 
So this is all going to come up, and we're going to bring the grade of this uh, of the new sidewalk up to within about an inch of this existing concrete that just got poured. So the idea is, is that if it sits, if this sidewalk comes up and sits about an inch to a half inch lower, that we can slope down to keep rainwater and stuff down off away from the building. Because the last thing you want is moisture, you know, in or around your building. You want it away from the building. So, uh, yeah, this, this sidewalk will be coming up. We're probably going to hold off until spring to really do anything with it. Um, just because, you know, contractors and stuff walking around all the time. It's the worst time to, you know, tear up anything is, you know, spring or winter because too cold or too wet, so. Uh, so same thing here. Uh, again, this is more uh, just to get a pouring these so that we can measure our total height for our doors. Uh, there are little pieces here. And as with some of the surrounding areas, we can large commercial grade windows in here as well. So this is, would be your main entrance here. Right now, they, again, they've just poured the sill so we can measure out. There will actually be a whole vestibule area that will be installed back. That's one of the next things we'll be doing is, uh, as far as phasing concrete, we'll be pouring that kind of the inside 20 by 10, we'll say. Nice. Of concrete. They fixed the brick here. Yeah, so the brick here was, uh, was broken until very recently. We had uh, one of our contractors kind of Ran into it with a piece of machinery, but uh, the the masons came in yesterday and kind of fixed it all up. So looks, looks good. good as new. Absolutely. Yep. When do they plan on washing the brick? So our brick contractor showed up today. He'll be probably in here mid next week to start washing all the brick. Got it. So the windows are going to go here. Yes. So how does that look with this fire uh, yep. protected? Uh, so this is going to get faced on all four sides. With uh, once our once our exterior contractor comes out, they'll be uh, which is you know your your different products and siding materials. I believe that, that is what is called out on here. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, there might the windows that are actually getting installed might actually completely cover this. Okay. Because. When you size your windows, they can only be a certain size without having some sort of structural support to, you know, carry the load that's kind of up here. Got Otherwise, it. you know, there's a good chance that your window glass could be compressed and cracked and shattered. So there had to be a support here. The window system actually might completely encase this. Um, the window, like, uh, styles on the, around the edges are all dark metal. Um, pieces that'll kind of match up with your brick color. Got it. On the exterior here, so. These guys are installing concrete color. what they're pouring into so to kind of prep the the individual spots where they're going to be pouring usually we've got to scrape down to the to the footing grade which you can kind of see the existing footing there and then they install rebar both vertical and horizontal that's to keep the, the concrete from from shifting at all because now it's that rebar is connected to the ground so it's not going to move at all um, so that's kind of an idea of what they pour into when they do it. Uh, one last portion that we're going to today is our exterior concrete column. So this right here is a, we, we built these, uh, so they're called forms. And what it is, is it's forming so that we can get a clean um, exterior face of the concrete. So once this is poured, this concrete column will actually be exposed to the public. Like you'll see it as an exposed concrete. So we wanted to make sure that this was obviously done correctly. Um, you know, you can see the rebar in here as well. One other thing that they'll actually do right before they pour the concrete is they'll actually install something called a form oil on the inside of this wood form. 
and that basically kind of allows the concrete in the form, once the concrete is dried, that that form just kind of pulls off very easily without pulling any concrete with it. So. The reason it's built the way it is is because that concrete per square foot, um, concrete per square foot is like 120 pounds, 130 pounds. So formwork, you know, especially stuff that where you're forming on all four sides, you, you got to do it right. You got to really beef it up and build it properly. Because um, if you don't, that concrete will literally just push it apart. So, you know, this is holding great because, you know, it's built the way it is. But, yeah. Now, was this rebuilt at one point? Yeah. There was an older form in here that, uh, that we didn't like. It. We, we came in and built it. What was the what was the issue with the older form? That's it right there. It just wasn't done correctly. It would never have held the concrete. Got it. It's just, it was put together kind of not as much uh, thought put into how it was built. Uh, some of the cuts are kind of crooked. And, uh, some of the nailing just wasn't spot on. So it just needed it needed to be done correctly, and you know. You're gonna be in a lot of this B-roll footage, man, so. <laughs> actually a walkable material on top of this TPO, um, obviously less slippery with the weather um, and more, you know, friendly to the occupants of each individual unit. So, so on, on the roof, we're putting this material, yeah. but on the patios, we're doing this as, as well as a secondary layer? There is a secondary okay. layer, and it's a walk specific for walkable decks. Got it. Okay. Exactly. Nice. Um, as you can see here, just to ensure that we don't have any leaks, this TPO material actually comes about a foot up off of the flat surface. And then they nail it in place, and they also use a, uh, a clock sealant, which is a, usually a silicone material that um, you know keeps anything from flowing through. And then your entire exterior um, face system, like a uh, like siding system, will come over the top of that so that to ensure, you know, no leaks. Okay, so on the left-hand side here, we got the shaft wall. Again, these, will, these shafts will actually run all the way to the roof. They're carrying our exhaust and our supply ducts for all three floors, as well as the first floor for future use. Um, but what's going to happen is, is each one will they will run all the way through, and then for each floor, there's going to be a supply that branches off of each one. So with this supply on this floor, it's going to come out, and it's going to supply that way. So we're going to have duct running along this hallway that way, and we'll have duct running along the hallway over here as well. So when we're going this way, we've encountered a slight routing problem. The routing problem in question is what you look at above. So these L is what call, are what are called structural LDLs. They're about 24 inches wide and they carry all of the truss load. So the problem is, is normally you're not supposed to cut into these to, to route anything through them because that'll damage the structural integrity of the building. So we don't want to run anything through them. So we had to kind of get creative and figure out how we were going to 
run our ductwork from the shaft to be able to supply, you know, fresh, cool, or warm air to this area right here. So the way we're going to do it is we're actually going to, for this one, we're going to dip below. We're going to carry right along the bottom edge of that LVO and then right along the bottom edge of this uh, beam here. The way we're going to do it is we can actually take, there's a certain um, air delivery, uh, like square footage, that has to be delivered to each space through the ductwork. So there's specific ductwork sizes that are that have to be followed in order to feed the proper amount of air. So with this one, what we did is in order to supply the same amount of air but get thinner ducts, we're going to do two of them. We're going to kind of Y off and branch into two different ducts that will then supply and come short right up against the top of that beam, and then they'll branch back into a larger one. Got it. So they're going to get reduced at the points where Correct. they're needing to... Yep. So they'll get reduced at the structural points that we can't, you know, mess with. Got it. And that'll allow us to keep a continuous ceiling. So a lot of times when you're in a, any regular building, um, what, what you're looking at in the ceiling is usually a drop lid. If you were to cut open that ceiling, all of your duct, all of your plumbing pipes, and all of your electrical stuff you would see up in that space. And that's exactly what we're doing here. We're running everything as tight as we can with the joist, and then there's a drop ceiling that comes about eight foot. So it's gonna be probably right about there. Will be the top of your ceiling that everybody, you know, the normal tenant will see. You guys yep. So it's gonna be eight, eight feet um, here and on this side. So it's Correct. all gonna be, got it. Yeah, so Even though it's so high, Correct. we're gonna lose all of that vaulted ceiling, or I guess that's not vaulted, but... We will lose the space, but the thing about, the reason why this is so vaulted like this is because every single unit has all of their electrical, all of their plumbing, and all of their HVAC, and all of the fire suppression running in this area. So the most amount of equipment will be running in here, and even though it's still going to be an eight-foot ceiling, it's going to be packed with equipment above. So. so now we're on the third floor here. And uh, we've got the same, not issue, but the same routing problem. So what's going to happen is instead of our junk popping out of the side on this floor to feed our hallways, it's actually going to go straight up into the, uh, up through the shaft wall. And it's going to drop over the top. It's going to come all the way over on the roof. And then it's going to drop down here through the trusses then feed the air like we like we said on the second floor it's gonna feed the air to this room. Now and about to lose it. when we go this way we'll still actually feed the this hallway the normal way. We'll still pop out the side and just go straight down the hallway. But for this one, because of our beams being so low, as you can see here this beam is bigger than the second floor. Since it's so big, um, you know running duct underneath it just doesn't make any sense. So we're actually gonna go up on the roof with it. Are called roof curbs. They curb up above your normal flat roof we're walking on right now. These are the three um, separate components of the chase of the chase that I was just talking about downstairs. So what's going to happen is, again, instead of routing our supply through the ceiling of the third floor, they're going to actually bring it up onto the roof, route it all the way over here. Then they'll cut the section here and run it straight down into the hallway below us so that we avoid you know, any dealing with any structural components of the building. Again, when it comes to a building and routing any of your electrical plumbing or HVAC, your number one rule is that you do not cut or mess with any of the structural components of the building that are you know, holding it up because then you damage the structural integrity of the building and then you you know, you can cause problems. So, so that's it for Flux City Weekly. Uh, I'm Eddie Carrington, Mayor of Flux City. Really hoping that you're finding true value out of these videos uh, as we continue to kind of go through the process of redeveloping um, a site from, from scratch, basically. So uh, make sure you like, subscribe, comment below, and we'll see you in the next video.